Hi everyone and welcome to the fourth webinar of um, the Reducer Juice series and the second webinar of 2022. So um, we already had an earlier view in uh, earlier in the day and now we're on the later broadcast. But yeah, going forward, we're going to have an early and a later broadcast for everyone. So um, yeah, it makes it more inclusive for people who might have different timetables. So yeah, what are we going to cover in this um, webinar about climate and race? It's such a broad topic, so um, hopefully we, yeah, we cover a good range of topics in this one, but um, yeah, we're always going to miss a few things. But yeah, in this webinar, we're going to go through the background of the um, injustice, uh, extraction and racism that frames um, injustice today. Uh, we're also going to go through some definitions, as always. You know to expect that now. And um, climate justice uh, and Black Lives Matter, um, the injustice of climate change in general, um, the effect uh, climate change has on the global south, climate exclusion, environmental racism, um, indigenous communities, representation in environmental sustainability, and yeah, the bit that you're waiting for, the challenge in the Q&A. So yeah, before I get into the discussions, um, yeah, a bit of a, a note on this webinar. Um, we realise uh, that there are lots of different interactions um, and intersectional aspects of this topic. So um, climate interacts with women, LGBTQ plus people and disabled people as well um, across as well as um, climate and race. And those all have um, interacting factors. But we've decided not to mention um, the interactions between those groups in this webinar because we don't want it to sort of be like a footnote and try and wrap up such a big topic into one. Um, but yeah, if you'd like to hear um, a webinar on those topics, just please send us an email or send us it in the chat and then we can hopefully get one in the next um, webinar series. But yeah, the discussion point for this, how do you think um, environment and race interact in your country? So we wanted to kind of have a a more not really a debate this time but sort of a bringing your own experience and kind of think about this during the webinar and hopefully the webinar will jog some thoughts and we'll come back to it at the end so yeah the sort of background of injustice extraction and racism that frames injustice today so if you joined us for the first webinar of the series you remember that climate change resulted out of um, rapid industrialization so this rapid industrialization was made possible by um, colonies in the south and the extraction of resources in these colonies, which often equated to the destruction of natural habitats and genocide of local people. So as you can see, the cartoon on the right is um, kind of a cartoon depicting sort of Western powers cutting up the world um, in a brutal way that yeah reflects the extraction of resource as well. Um, yeah, this industrialization birthed the ongoing economic reliance on extraction, exploitation ac and accumulation through disposition, dispossession. Um, this ensures that climate and change and racism will always be interlinked. Um, if we're going to take the US as an example, and we'll go into more examples like this in later in the webinar, but um, the interaction between climate and race is quite apparent in the US. So free slaves were given land and settled in areas that were deemed less valuable and therefore eventually surrounded by petrochemical plants that were more easily open to pollute. So it gives you a little bit of background. So environmental justice is a phrase that we hear quite a lot today um, and wanted to give you a definition. So the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, colour, national origin or income, with respect to the development, implementation and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations and policies. So I would encourage anyone to have a look at the 17 principles of environmental justice, which were created by Black, Latino, Native American and Asian American um, people earlier in this century. Climate justice. So climate justice is again another phrase that you'll hear linked in the climate movement and again as you can see on the right it's often involved in protest, the um, calling for climate justice. But what is climate justice? Climate justice recognises the climate crisis as a social political problem as well as an environmental one 
And it is a kind of theme that myself and Matt talk about a lot is um, not seeing um, environmental solutions just in their silo. It's not just an environmental issue or a sort of physical geography issue. It involves um, social, political, economic, all sorts of factors go into um, solving this crisis. It also acknowledges that different communities around the world will feel the effects of climate change differently. Um, and the responsibility for tackling climate change does not rest equally among countries and companies. Some are more responsible than others. So if we go back to the background of the um, climate crisis and industrialization, um, we'll get into specific stats, but also you can see that the most polluting countries in the world might not be the ones that are going to feel the effects of climate change um, the most, and the same goes for people. Um, and another thing that it acknowledges is that injustice and oppression already exist and will be exacerbated by the effects of climate change. So sorry for the dense text, but I didn't want to cut out any of this, um, this great quote from Indian activist Disha Ravi. Um, so I think she summarizes the fact the climate justice really well. So climate justice is about intersectional equity. It's about being radically inclusive of all groups of people so that everyone has access to clean air, food and water. As a dear friend always says, climate justice isn't just for the rich and white. It's a fight alongside those who are displaced, whose rivers have been poisoned, whose lands were stolen, who watch their houses get washed away every other season and who fight tirelessly for what are basic human rights. So on to climate justice and Black Lives Matter. So if you're following sort of um, the Black Lives Matter movement in um, sort of mid 2020, there were loads of articles that came out um, from the sources where I get my environmental information that linked the two and sort of highlighted that climate and race are really um, interlinked. So I'd encourage you just to do a quick Google search and you can have a look at some of those um, articles from that period. But Crisis frequently highlight and exacerbate the inequalities that already exist in society. If you think of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans um, and COVID-19 in the UK and US, people of colour are dying at disproportionately high rates um, and the climate crisis is no different. So Patrice Coulos and Noessi um, Nouveau said, Nouveau? Nouveau? Sorry. Um, racism is endemic to global inequality. This means that those that are most affected and killed by climate change are black and poor people. And we'll kind of um, hammer some of those points home later in the webinar. Um, I'll not be giving an in-depth background of the Black Lives Matter movement due to time, um, but even if you think you're familiar with the movement, I'd encourage everyone to refresh that knowledge um, as many media outlets and individuals have made efforts to confuse and muddy the aims and um, makeup of the group. Um, yeah, the Black Lives Matter movement highlights the systematic and institutionalized racism that results in the death of black people, be that through police brutality or the residential segregation that leads to the death of black people and Native Americans due to pollution. So that's kind of a bit of um, how they are interlinked. So a really interesting thing that um, came around that time was the red, black and green New Deal. Um, Matt, if possible, could you put the link to the Green New Deal in the um, the red, black and green New Deal in the chat? Um, so it's it's a campaign that again asserted that racial justice is climate justice and the activists proposed a national climate agenda as part of the large movement for black lives, including the BLM network. This mandate covers six areas, water, energy, land, labour, economy and democracy relating each area to the environment and race. And I'd encourage anyone to read this a bit further. Again, they kind of accompany each of these points with the nine point plan that addresses each of these points in a um, how how can it be achieved situation or and relates each to climate and race and the environment. So you've heard enough from me for just a second. Um, have there been any movements that address the interaction between climate and race in your country. So that's just something to think about. Um, be that a politician talking about it or um, a grassroots movement or anything like that. It'd be great to hear sort of um, examples from across the globe. So while you guys um think about that, I kind of wanted to give um, 
a little bit of the injustice of climate change. So racism do not, does not always manifest in um, sort of overt acts of racial abuse, although it does sometimes, unfortunately, or through consciously insidious intent. It can be persistent in the frameworks that exist throughout the world. So I think um, seeing racism as only sort of overt acts of racial abuse misses the fact that it um, can be endemic to some of the structures that exist throughout the world. In the case of climate change, I personally don't believe there's a secret society that is actively trying to inflict more damage on the communities within the global south. However, I think through the systems and the injustices we have in place, people of colour are consistently more likely to suffer the consequences of climate change. And that kind of gets on to sort of environmental racism and that kind of thing in a moment. Uh, just before we move on, Matt, have we got anyone? Um, commenting on any movements that have addressed the interaction between climate and race? Um, no one's got, yeah, no one's yet shared any kind of, yeah, movements that are addressing that. So yeah, if you've got any thoughts, pop them in the Q&A box there and we can shout them out. Um, we have had someone coming back on your previous, on your kind of the opening question, um, and yeah, pointing out that um, indigenous people in Brazil are suffering because of the Bolsonaro administration's pro-business alliance. Um, so yeah, a nice example there. I know kind of, yeah, Ryan, you've got a lot of other examples which you're going to kind of in case studies you'll share with us later on, but I don't think there are any from Brazil, are there? So yeah, no, it's a yeah, really interesting one to hear about there. Um, and yeah, if, if the person who posts that's got any more details or any links they can share, yeah, pop them in the chat and we can share them with everyone. But yeah, I think um, it is an area, I suppose it has had some press attention, certainly in the UK and globally as well, um, around yeah, how indigenous people are kind of being impacted is, particular, I suppose, kind of logging and, and other um, business activities kind of start to encroach on their land as well. So, um, yeah, I know there is a little bit you're going to on Indigenous people later in the webinar and kind of how Indigenous communities are, are being kind of impacted. So, uh, yeah, hopefully that'll be of interest to personally shared that. Um, oh, see, we've got another comment come in here. Um, Uh, so yeah, someone's made an interesting comment, which actually I think you'll be interested in one of the slides where Ryan's got coming up shortly. Yeah, someone made the comment that um, this year is more to do with poverty and climate change um, and less to do with racism. And it's just that um, people from black, Asian and minority ethnic communities tend to be less well off, um, which I think yeah, is, is an, a, a, a belief that I think maybe quite a few people hold. But yeah, actually, there's been some interesting studies on that that I, I won't take away from what Ryan's about to tell us shortly. But yeah, there have been certainly some interesting studies on that, which um, kind of to a degree or in certain areas at least kind of debunk that. So um, yeah, but thank you very much for sharing that one. It's always good to kind of get those different views. I'll publish that one as well. Um, and yeah, any other thoughts? Um, yeah, please send them across and um, yeah, we'll, we'll keep sharing. But I'll pass back to you now, Ryan. Yeah, thanks, Matt. So yeah, the impact of climate change disproportionately affecting the global south. So to set the scene, um, the responsibility for climate change, uh, the 50 least least developed nations of the world have only contributed 1% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, as a footnote, and the reason for those air quotations is, I kind of want to highlight that I think the phrase least developed has um, significant issues that sort of ignore culture, happiness, economic disparity and um, other important factors in a society. So um, I don't think least developed is a fair description, but you guys get what I mean when I say that. Um, often due to geographical location, many countries um, people refer to as the global south will suffer more severe weather events, flooding and sea level rise first. In these countries, higher proportions of the population rely on agriculture to survive and in um, inhabit more insecure housing, so the aforementioned of events can have more catastrophic effects. In addition to this, um, with less money to spend, government cannot allocate as much to climate adaptation to soften the effects of climate change. So this was an area of discussion at the recent COP, um, and if you revisit our COP episode that we did at the end of last year on our YouTube channel, um, you can kind of get we can get into more detail about sort of adaptation and that's coming up in our next webinar as well so adaptation funds will be discussed so um can you state any other ways that climate change affects the global south so yeah sort of opening up to the audience again um and yeah we'll come back to that once you've had some time to um 
yeah, put your thoughts in the chat. So yeah, moving on to um, the case study uh, in Zambia. So um, it's important to take into account before we get into this, that the average carbon footprint of a Zambian person is less than one tenth of the UK average. So that really puts into perspective of um, yeah, the UK average person in comparison to the average Zambian person in terms of their contributions to global emissions. Um, in 2021, they experienced a drought that meant that one million needed food assistance. Um, and the IPCC have predicted that going forward, rainfall will become more variable, which will again um, mean that situations like what happened in 2021, um, droughts are going to be more likely. Um, and I was in a course today where they yeah, said that it was almost certain that um, rainfall disparity is going to be one of the effects that are happening in the next few years. Um, another thing to note is that this crisis ranked number one in underreported humanitarian crisis of 2021. And um, the words of N Vanessa Nakate, um, climate activist, come to mind, which is that the global south is not on the front page, but on the front line. Uh, yeah, so here's another quote. Um, again, apologies for the um, excessive text on the thing, but I don't want to cut it out again. So this is from a Zambian climate activist, Veronica Mulenga, and she says that historical and present day injustices have both left black, indigenous and people of colour communities exposed to far greater environmental health hazards than white communities. Um, those most affected by climate change are black and poor communities. And as a continent, we are one of the hardest hit by the impacts of climate change and we are left behind as the world progresses to a low carbon economy. Without taking into account those most affected, climate solutions will turn into climate exclusion. So what is kind of climate exclusion? So it's the criticism that the um, voices most harshly affected by climate change are excluded from the discussions for solutions and through the narrative of um, sort of saving the planet. So at COP26, due to um, a lack of funding available and vaccines not being as widely available, many delegates um, and activists could not attend COP26, such as Veronica Mulenga. Um, this is in stark contrast to those who um, attended our last webinar knew, know that um, fossil fuel companies had the largest number of delegates at COP26. So there's that sort of disparity between the people who are on the front line of climate change and the fossil fuel companies who are causing it, their representation at the um, largest climate discussions uh, in the world. Um, in addition, the narrative around many climate stories is that these nations need to be saved from the harsh consequences of climate change at the mercy of governments from the global north. So sort of a whether they decide to send the money, whether that, that kind of thing um, often is the narrative uh, for the people who are yet yeah, again on the front line. Um, if this is to change, more voices from the global south need to be included and pushed to the forefront, um, especially in terms of climate solutions. So um, what is environmental racism? So the environmental racism is the oppression of people through an unequal exposure to environmental hazards. Um, the oppression is often systematic through policies that place communities of colour um, in close proximity to polluting or toxic industries. This is often the case where people of colour are in the ethnic minority, so say for example in the US or the UK, or um, a lack of enforcement of policies such as um, international law that doesn't allow toxic materials to be exported or perhaps exporting of waste. So this applies um, sort of on an international scale of um, countries in the global north exporting to the global south and we'll kind of get into that. So kind of on the um, point that was raised uh, a moment ago, um, Dr. Robert Bullard proved that African-American children were five times more likely to have lead poisoning from proximity to waste than Caucasian children. Um, this is even the case while black Americans were making um, 50 to $60,000 a year were more likely to live in polluted areas than their white counterparts making $10,000 a year. So that kind of um, yeah says that while a lot of the time sort of economic factors are to play um, in this case in America, it is an, um, it's almost irrespective of uh, income. 
So on to another case study uh, of sort of environmental racism, um, Cancer Alley in Louisiana. So it's an 85 mile stretch along the Mississippi River that's um, lined with nearly 150 oil refineries and petrochemical plants. So the um, image on the right is a really stark reminder of sort of yeah, a graveyard in this area in Louisiana with the oil refineries on the horizon. Um, the location got its name because residents in the area are 50 times more likely to develop cancer than the average American. Um, the air quality in this area is some of Louisiana's worst air and the surrounding water supply is heavily polluted. So back to an episode of greenwashing. Um, yeah, frequent plugs to other um, webinar episodes in this one. Um, one of the largest plants in the area, Shintech, has been approved for an expansion and they have said that they do not believe their expansion will have an adverse effect. However, the EPA estimates that the level of carcinogenic chemicals are already doubled the area's average and that's estimated to increase by 16% um, in line with Shintech's expansion. Um, so to give you an idea of the demographic of this um, area of Louisiana, so the area of Louisiana is 40% of the population are black compared to a state average of 32% and a national and the national average of 12% um, with an example from one of the most polluted areas St. John um, Motor, excuse me um, to take a specific example one of the most polluted parishes St. John's the Baptist um, comprising at least of 90% of black residents so that kind of gives you an idea of the most polluted area in one of the most polluted areas called Cancer Alley um, is home to 90% black residents, which is way above the um, national average. So yeah, this is um, also present in Mexico. So another example in Southwest Mexico where black and Afro indigenous com communities have historically relied on lagoons, lagoons for many aspects of their way of life. Um, so yeah, I think uh, they were, yeah, there, there's a heavy black um, Mexican population around the lagoons in the southwest of Mexico. As a result of industrialization of oil seeds, so that's kind of um, sunflower seeds and things like that used to make oil for cooking and other um, uses. So the, these were industrialized in the 70s and 90s, and this has amounted to pollution in the lagoons. Um, furthermore, in irrigation has caused the freshwater supplies to be drained for tourism um, in surrounding areas. So the government has exerted strong control over the area um, for the means of in industry, tourism and agriculture, but does not apply any of the same controls to polluting. So they're very keen to push, um, push industry and tourism and agriculture forward, but don't um, have strict controls on what those industries sort of produce and um, how they pollute the surrounding area. So this is killing populations of fish with huge amounts washing up on the shore. So you can see on the right that, um, yeah, there are huge amounts of fish washing up on the shore. And in 2017, this um, really came to the fore. And this in turn is killing the black and indigenous population who rely on the lagoons to survive. So um, yeah, before we move on, uh, asked the question earlier, can you state any other ways climate change affects the global south? And yeah, it'd be interesting to hear if anybody's put any more in the chat. Yeah, no, we've had um, yeah a few examples coming in from uh, different people. So yeah, thank you very much for sharing those. Yeah, all of you that have. Um, one yeah uh, comment that came in from Swang Deshen, um, yeah, hopefully that wasn't too far off, um, was yeah that climate change is adversely affecting the slums in Bangladesh, um, which he said is, has recently been reported in The Economist. Um, and yeah, that climate change is affecting those, uh, the kind of those in the most, I suppose, uh, uh, undeveloped countries. So yeah, it's an interesting example, the example of Bangladesh. Um, where kind of a lot of the low lying land um, is really already starting to see the uh, impacts of um, sea level rise um, and also there they're having issues with um, the salination of um, kind of lots of their uh, water wells for um, their own drinking water but also for um, uh, agriculture and those sorts of elements as the water table rises um, and uh, yeah uh, exactly as you say uh, it really is affecting kind of um, 
kind of ethnic minority groups in the country and and also kind of yeah the, the poorest among 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 them um, another interesting example that was shared um, was uh, around gentrification that kind of yeah gentrification can play a role in environmental racism um, which I suppose yeah is, is quite possibly true that um, as kind of certain areas gentrify um, people who are often yeah um, from minority communities are forced um, to find alternative areas and places to live um, which can well be kind of those with lower environmental standards or kind of closer to air pollution or kind of yeah some of the other issues I know Ryan will um, touch on shortly um, so yeah thank you very much for sharing those um, well actually um, yeah Swang also shared um, some really positive uh, a piece of positive news as well which is always nice we're having these sorts of discussions um, they said that yeah recently um, there was a $50 million um, dollar deal um, to uh, an Indian tribe because they faced hardship during the white rule and um, yeah, to kind of compensate for environmental damages. So um, yeah, they said that that was reported on the BBC. So yeah, if you've got a link for that one, that'd be really interesting to share with others. It's always nice to see kind of, I suppose, where at least reparations are being paid. Um, and yeah, hopefully lessons will be learned so that um, yeah, similar issues don't continue in the present day and um, yeah future reparations aren't needed to be needing to be paid so yeah those are the bits um, we have had a couple of questions coming in as well but i'll um yeah i'll save those up for, for the discussion at the end but yeah thanks everyone for posting so far and yeah keep popping things in the q a thanks matt and um yeah swang thank you for um yeah putting that uh link in and if you could um if you're aware of the link in the uh, mm, uh, the Facebook group that we've got, yeah, it'd be great if you could share that with um, the community of people that couldn't make it to this episode. So yeah, keeping you guys working hard on a webinar, um, how many swimming pools worth of plastic is exported by the UK every day? So those that attended the plastics webinar um, might already have the answer to this, but yeah, I'll give you a few moments to um, yeah, shoot some guesses in. Yep, just so everyone knows we are working on about a kind of 20 to 30 second delay. Um, so yeah, once we speak, there's a little gap until you guys hear it and then get your questions in, your uh, responses in, sorry. Um, yeah, just I suppose to follow up on what Ryan was saying around our four previous plastics webinar. Um, all of our uh, previous webinars are uploaded onto our YouTube channel. Um, we will, yeah, we'll, kind of, we'll share all the details of those, I think, on the last slide of, of the webinar. Um, so, yeah, if you ever wanted to catch up on kind of any you've missed um, or kind of see any of the webinars that we've put out um, last year and previously, then, yeah, yeah, take a look on our YouTube page. Um, and, yeah, you'll see a whole range of, um, yeah, different topics being dis discussed um, on there. So, oh, yeah, we've had, we started to, um, yeah, have a few uh, uh, suggestions come in for the answer. So, thank you very much for getting involved, everyone. Um, one person has said three, so that'll be E. Um, yeah, we've got, oh, actually we've got uh, three, three, four there for E. Um, a couple of people have said D. And yeah, and there's one C in there as well. So I suppose, yeah, a bit of a mix, but um, all certainly toward the higher end um, in terms of the swimming pools. But oh, yeah, I'll hand over to you, Ryan, to let us know the answer. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um... So yeah, the person that um, selected D uh, was obviously at the past six webinar, or maybe you just know that um, off the top of your head. But um, yeah, that kind of gets us on to dumping of recycling and plastics in Asia. So um, on another element of environmental racism. So um, the UK exports 2.5 swimming pools worth of plastic to Southeast Asia every day. Um, countries have been banning the imports of plastic waste. So um, it, in sort of the mid 2010s, um, mostly the UK and EU were sending their plastics to China. China stopped the import of plastics um, and plastic waste. Then this moved to Thailand um, and Cambodia and um, countries around that area. And then um, they imposed a ban and then it moved on to Malaysia, which is currently where the burden lies for um, some of the global Norse waste. So communities in these countries suffer where plastics pile 10 feet high and the impact of these are crops are poisoned and harmful toxins leach into the ground. And obviously to combat the buildup of this much waste without um, huge amounts of recycling um, infrastructure, 
uh, much of the waste has to be burnt. So poisoning the local communities who did nothing to create the waste. And on um, a similar vein to this, more than 44 million tonnes of e-waste was generated globally in 2017. So to give you an idea of how much e-waste that is, that's six kilograms per person on the planet. So if we were all ca carrying around um, six kilograms worth of e-waste every year, that was how much was produced um, in 2017. So Western exporters label the unsalvageable goods um, as reusable, which means they avoid international laws which prohibit the tra transport of the waste. So um, in the West, yeah, they're sort of packaging them up as sort of reusable under the guise of sending it to um, uh, countries in the global south as being, yeah, here's um, waste that you can use. Um, they're actually unsalvageable and toxic. So 352, 474,000 metric tons of electronic waste was being illegally shipped from the EU to developing countries each year. Um, unfortunately, the UK tops this list for the European worst offender um, and the UN Environmental Programme identified Nigeria and Ghana as the top, um, the world's top destinations for e-waste. So e-waste contains toxic chemicals such as mercury and lead and often to dispose of these items they are burnt as well. So you can see on the right that some, somebody disposing of some e-waste by burning it. Um, this leads to high risk of um, respiratory and skin diseases and often settlements aren't far from these um, yeah sort of landfill um, sort of informal landfill sites so there are settlements on the edges of these which um, people as yeah, and young children are inhaling these fumes again for waste that they did not create or purchase. So on to sort of climate and race in the UK um, in late 2020, um, Ella Kisi Deborah was the first person in the UK to have their cause of death lift listed as air pollution. Um, the area Ella lived in southeast London, Catford, exceeded legal EU limits in the years prior to her death. Um, black people in London are more likely to be exposed to toxic air than white people. So in Southwark, where I live, it has a black population of 17.37%. Um, and 3% of the UK is black or identifies as black. Um, and the nitrogen dioxide levels in Southwark have reached 90 micrograms per cubic meter of air, um, over double the WHO limit of 40 micrograms. So systematic injustice, this kind of touches on um, uh, what was commented on earlier about it not being about racism. Um, systematic injustices translate into environmental and socioeconomic inequalities. So it doesn't, again, have to be um, over acts of sort of insidious racism, but the systematic injustices that leading to black people living in these areas um, are part of institutional racism. So, and in many cases, including this one, it equates to death because of the environment that you live in. So, so carbon offsets, um, I'm not 100% sure, but this might be my last plug for a previous episode. But if you didn't join us for the last episode on greenwashing, um, we discussed the complexities of carbon offsets. Um, we sort of discussed it in the way of, does it, um, does it lead to companies just putting off um, actual carbon savings in the future? Um, and that aspect of carbon offsets, but they've also been criticized by indigenous leaders as um, kicking the can down the road and perpetuating the theft of ind indigenous lands. So um, in terms of lands that have been inhabited and protected for, so yeah, sorry, in terms of framing that, these are lands that have been inhabited and protected for hundreds of years, um, and they're now being used um, as sort of offsets to meet the needs of the largest polluters. So. Um, if huge companies in the global north are coming in and saying, oh yeah, we're now paying to control these lands um, um, and we'll kind of get into the yeah, dangers of that later. But um, this has been referred to as climate um, carbon colonialism. So yeah, sort of indigenous communities, um, I found it really interesting looking at sort of, I knew I was sort of guilty of thinking of indigenous communities as um, sort of more exclusive to the Americas, so North and South America. But um, 
Indigenous communities present locally, globally, I'd encourage you all to, um, if you haven't already, research the definition and see some of the communities across the world. So um, I wasn't aware of any of the Indigenous communities that were in Europe and um, some areas of like India, Africa, all that. Um, it's just like I found that really interesting. So Indigenous people are particularly vulnerable to climate change, both physically and legally as well. So moving on, um, an example of this is the Sengwe community in, in Western Kenya. So in Western Kenya, a World Bank sponsored conservation program forcibly removed um, a population of 15,000 in the name of conservation, stating that this indigenous community was degrading the forest. So this kind of goes back to the offset situation where um, maybe yeah, a remote um, organization has come in and said we're now conserving this forest. we're now protecting it um, and the people that are living there aren't in line with our conservation um, ideas. So um, conservation research has found that what the World Bank said wasn't correct and they found that securing the rights of the tenants that already live there of these areas increases forest cover, species diversity and reduces deforestation. Um, in this situation, unfortunately, people were arrested, including elders and small children, and these conflicts around the world with indigenous um, conservationists are frequently violent and many indigenous lives have been lost in the name of a conservation scheme. Um, Amnesty International stated the same where people were never generally consulted, nor was their free and informed consent ever obtained prior to their eviction. This is a flagrant violation of Kenyan and international law. So it gives you an idea of what um, they thought of the situation. Um, yeah, so this is a stat um, so that at least 1,005 environmental land rights, um, land rights defenders have been murdered since the Paris Accords were signed six years ago. So according to the international nonprofit Global Witness, one of and one in three of those killed were indigenous people. Um, it's not that I don't think you guys can read, by the way. Um, I just do it for in case anyone's kind of got me on in the background that I'm still reading out. So, um, yeah, it kind of explains why I'm reading out some of these longer quotes. So, yeah, um, what's wrong with this photo? I'm going to give people a few minutes to uh, decipher what's wrong with it and make up for the delay. But um, has there been any more activity in the chat while we yeah, decipher what's right. wrong with the photo? Yeah, yeah, while we wait for people to kind of post in what they think yeah, is wrong with the picture you're showing up at the moment. Um, yeah, we have had a couple of bits. A couple more questions are coming in. Um, so thank you very much. I'm storing up kind of the bigger questions for our Q&A at the end. But yeah, we've got some really good questions coming in. So uh, brace yourself, Ryan. Um, and yeah, yeah, keep them coming in. We're looking forward to discussing those. Um, also had a correction from um, Tsuang, who I, I mentioned their comment before around the reparations paid to um, uh, an, Indi an Indian community. Um, I think I said it was a 50 million US dollar um, reparation payment, but it was actually 500 million dollars. So um, yeah, kind of a significant amount of money. So yeah, I thought we'd let you know um, the, the information there. Um, um, yeah, so yeah, I think they're kind of most of the comments we've had coming in as yet. I'm waiting for people um, yeah, we've got a few comments starting to trickle in as to um, yeah, kind of what was wrong with the photo. Um, yeah, one person has suggested that um, yeah, a, a black activist was cut out of um, the image, um, and yeah, another person said yeah, another activist um, was was erased from the image. So um, yeah, on that, I'll hand back over to you, Ryan. And thank you everyone for yeah posting in uh, your responses. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, thank you all for that. Yeah, so if we move on to the next image, yeah, you would have seen that um, an activist has just been cut out of this um, photo of, yeah, almost got my mass wrong. I was about to say four. Five of them, um, five young activists, um, all deserving of their place at the front of this photo. Um, yeah, unfortunately, um, Vanessa Nakate was cut out. So that kind of brings me on to racial representation in environmental roles and sustainability. So um, I'm not sure if this is uh, present across the whole world, but yeah, definitely um, many have perceptions that the Western environmental movements are white and middle class um, and that those are the only people who can afford to um, yeah, make the changes, which isn't true sort of um, 
sorry, yeah, isn't true from yeah many perspectives, but yeah, that's the perception that um, people have perhaps of like Extinction Rebellion here in the UK and um, other movements in the West. So um, in the US, a survey of hundreds of environmental organisations stated that only 16 percent were um, only 16% of the organization staff were people of color compared to a national average of 35%. So that's not even um, in environmentally facing roles, that's um, members of staff of these organizations, only 16% um, yeah, were people of color as opposed to 35% of the makeup of the country. Um, if you do a quick Google search as well, you'll find many um, personal stories of ethnic minorities feeling um, marginalized, um, tokenized and ignored within the climate movement. So yeah, I kind of just encourage a quick Google search of sort of like racism within environmental organizations and things like that. Um, and you can find sort of personal accounts. So this problem is also present in the UK environmental sustainability field um, and it's the second most white sector behind agriculture and um, I feel like it's sort of often ignored and often um, not mentioned this issue with sort of the environmental sustainability sector in the UK. Um, yeah, not often putting themselves under the spotlight um, in this situation. So yeah, to sort of give you an idea of the representation and makeup of the industry, um, I know this isn't specific to do with race and um, this is sort of a gender issue, but what percentage of the presidents and board chairs of environmental groups were male? So yeah, kind of put in a, um, where you think that sort of lies on those different figures? Brilliant, thanks, Ryan. Yeah, while we wait for the lag to catch up, and uh, yeah, uh, everyone on the webinar to yeah start um, sending across your guesses. Um, yeah, I can. Yeah, there's been a little more activity in the chat. Um, uh, so yeah, um, Swang was saying that they're joining us from Nepal, which is yeah great. And I think one of the things we absolutely love about this community is just how how global it is. So um, yeah, thank you very much for joining us. Um, yeah, they're they're kind of giving some information around um, an attempted uh, reintroduction of a plastics ban um, in 2016, 2017 in Nepal, um, but unfortunately it hasn't worked out. So yeah, I think plastics remain a really big issue. Um, and yeah, as we've touched on, we do we have had a webinar on plastics. So if you wanted to take a look at that, that's on our YouTube channel. Um, oh, and we've started to have some um, people getting involved in the question here. So so far we've had um, two Ds. So was that that 60 to 70 percent people are suggesting? Um, we've also oh, and a third D as well. Seems that Ds are a strong, a strong, a strong bet um, at the moment. Um, oh, someone's gone for an E as well. So greater than 70 percent. Um, I'll give it a few more seconds to see if anything else is coming in, but um, yeah, feeling a little bit like a uh, commentator on the horse racing. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, there's another D coming in there as well. So it seems, yeah, uh, a weight of uh, votes for D. So yeah, I'll hand back over to you. Ryan. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, safety in numbers there with um, everyone going for D, but yeah, so um, to give you an idea, this photo here is an, um, from an environmental group or anything but it kind of gave you an idea that um yeah the actual figure is more than 70 percent so um e in that case so um yeah more than 70 percent of the presidents and board chairs of environmental groups were male um at the richest organizations and those with annual budgets of over 1 million 90 percent were male i think that's specific to the us um in this case but yeah, when I was working in sort of conferences and stuff, um, one of the key things that we always yeah, got told was when forming our panels and forming our discussions is that don't make them exclusively male, pale and stale. So I think that could be applied to um, environmental organisations as well. So um, race, racial diversity in these organisations um, is still lagging far behind with boards and general staff not exceeding 16% in all organisations, which I just mentioned. Um, and where, yeah, in the, and 3.5% of those who work in the environmental sector in the UK identify as an ethnic minority when I think, um, it's trying to do my maths here, I think it's 78% white in the UK, so 22% ethnic minorities, is that correct? Yeah, thanks Matt. <laughs> um, so it just kind of goes to show you as a percentage, they are very low um, of sort of ethnic minorities in the environmental field. 
So yeah, I kind of wanted to open this up to uh, discussion again. Don't worry, I'm not making you guys do all the work for this webinar, but um, yeah, really want to hear your opinions. But yeah, what does it mean kind of going forward? What are the problems that can occur with like an all white male board? Um, well, first I'll ask Matt, who's sitting in your office with me. Um, yeah, no, thanks, Ryan. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, there's, uh, there's a whole range of issues, I suppose, of not having that diversity at the top of an organisation. Um, uh, yeah, I, I hopefully you guys will kind of tick some off as well. But I think one of the first um, that come to mind is that many people make uh, decision making is based on their own lived experience. Um, so, yeah, if it was a largely um, white and male board, then um, yeah, a lot of their decision making will be made around the white male experience. So kind of won't necessarily thinking about how the decisions they make um, impact um, um, women and people of other genders and um, also won't be kind of considering how we yeah, have people of kind of other um, ethnicities and backgrounds kind of might be impacted by their decision making as well. So yeah, I think it is a particularly difficult one. Uh, I think the other piece is that um, I think there's been a lot of information kind of increasing information coming out around um, uh, um, kind of people's uh, natural biases and I imagine that the board will kind of have a lot of um, impact on kind of who's hired and who kind of joins these organizations um, and yeah it's much easier for um, uh, kind of yeah if again being white male um, for to, to hire kind of more white men into the organization which kind of further exacerbates the issues um, and means that kind of one there isn't access to jobs and roles for um, kind of people from uh, other backgrounds um, but also kind of further um, exacerbates the issue of um, them kind of not necessarily focusing on on the breadth of, of, of different uh, lived experiences and um, making sure that the organization is kind of championing everyone I suppose. Um, still waiting for any comments to come in on the chat so yeah, if you've got any thoughts pop it in it's a slightly longer one so I'll give a little bit longer for people to send in their responses. Um, yeah what were your thoughts on that one Ryan? Yeah so, oh. yeah, so I had similar ideas to you in terms of sort of having an all white male board means um, continued climate exclusion and um, solutions to the climate crisis that do not deliver climate justice. So if we come back to our um, earlier definition of climate justice, um, yeah, if your solution to sort of all based again, as Matt says, on the lived experience of um, a specific sector of the community, then you're not going to be delivering it for some of all the different marginalised groups that exist. Um, again, I think it leads to poor messaging that only um, reads to specific groups um, and creates a perpetual cycle. So if you're putting out messaging that maybe is coming from an all white male board, then I don't think that will um, reach in the same way as um, reach other groups in the same way than if it was more representative. And that creates a cycle where then more people are getting into the industry and vice um, yeah, as it goes. Um, again, young people from ethnic minorities will feel that the movement is not for them and sort of check out and ideally we need everyone pulling in the right direction um, if we're going to solve the climate crisis in a fair and equitable way. Cool. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. We've had yeah um, one comment come in. Um, yeah, with a few different um, yeah suggestions as to as to why this is problematic. Um, yeah, kind of the first thing that they suggest is a lack of sensitivity, um, which is actually a really interesting piece in a discussion that we were having kind of only a few days ago um, around kind of obviously kind of this is all broad brushstrokes, but that um, generally yeah women um, often have kind of better interpersonal skills than men and kind of have that kind of greater level of sensitivity which I think what um, the person who commented this is suggesting um, and that actually kind of yeah we need um, there was a discussion around kind of um, gender and uh, the climate movement and how kind of we need that that kind of that kind of more sensitive um, approach um, to kind of changing these problems and that kind of collaborative approach which again in broad brushstrokes women are seen to generally have um, a greater skill with so yeah I think that's one issue um, the second is yeah obvious lack of representation of gender and race which yeah I think it's nice to kind of call out as plainly as that that yeah that is that is in itself just problematic so yeah thank you for drawing attention to that and the third one was kind of similar to what you were just saying Ryan um, which is kind of that lack of representation may cause resentment in the underrepresented communities and they may be reluctant to consider any suggestions of the board. So as you said, as kind of you said, Ryan, that can kind of play out in terms of people, um, whether they kind of listen to and join that environmental movement. But actually, I think the person who was making the comment was perhaps referring more to actually within the organisation themselves. And uh, yeah, I think that was kind of an interesting perspective, which I hadn't really considered as well, that um, yeah, if you don't feel that the people at the top of your organisation represent and are thinking about you and their decision making, yeah, are you really going to kind of keep 
following towing that line and i suppose you kind of end up with a, a disempowered and disinterested and less effective workforce so yeah no really interesting thank you very much for for sharing um those um yeah really interesting so yeah i'll pass over back over to you Ryan. uh yeah thanks matt so um yeah kind of similar ideas across all of us there so i kind of wanted to highlight um yeah, this is quite a small scheme in the UK, but I kind of want to highlight that there are um, schemes and it might jog your memory or um, to see if you've got one in your country, or you can pass this on to a family member or something like that. So Race for Nature is a government scheme that aims to place 118 unemployed 16 to 24 year olds from predominantly ethnic minority backgrounds into the UK's environmental sector to kind of tackle what we were talking about earlier. Um, Organisations involved are RSPB, Friends of Earth and um, ZSL. Um, placements are in a wide range of conservation, fundraising, um, social media, research, marketing and administration. So, excuse me, um, a wide range of roles. Um, again, placements offer a living wage, so there's 24 hours of training and um, career support. And yeah, they aim for 50% of these schemes to become permanent. So just an interesting scheme that the UK has. So yeah, onto I thought I'd share some um, non-white climate activists, starting with Vanessa Nakate, um, especially because I don't want uh, her to just be boiled down to the girl that was cropped out of Greta Thunberg's photo. So um, she's done some amazing stuff. So she was the first school striker in Uganda, um, spearheaded a campaign to save Congo's rainforest, Especially on the sort of point of climate strikes in Uganda um, and across the world, it's not sort of a one size fits all in terms of um, the ease it is to protest around the world um, and that can change sort of country to country. Um, she also to raise awareness about the crisis of agriculture in Africa, she underwent a hunger strike. So uh, a really interesting statement and um, I'll bring you back to earlier as well, Vanessa said, about the um about sort of yeah the global south not being on the front line of not being on the front page but being on the front line so she definitely has a way with words and saying that um we cannot eat coal we cannot drink oil no one serves fossil fuels at the dining table so that was underpinning her climate um agricultural hunger strike So on to another one, Tom Goldtooth, and he's already been represented in the um, webinar as well. So Tom Goldtooth was the person who was highlighting the issues with um, carbon offsets and came and sort of uh, voiced the protest about sort of um, carbon colonialism and um, climate colonialism. Um, he also co-authored along with many other things, reducing emissions for from deforestation and degradation and created a award-winning um, documentary called Drumbeat from Mother Earth with exposed toxic chemicals polluting the food chain um, and has protested and spoke for indigenous peoples at um, many of the cops for I think for over like 30 years now. Um, yeah, apologies for my pronunciation of his name but Yo Hong Yi um, is a young climate Chinese climate activist um, getting a country where it's sort of Activism isn't the same as in here in the UK. Um, joined the international climate strikes and was detained by police in Shanghai for uh, activism. Yeah, that's. I'd also like to mention that's by no means even close to being a um, comprehensive list of uh, sort of cl uh, climate activists across the world. But those are just three that I like the stories of. Um, but yeah hopefully uh, do some research and share it in the Facebook group if you find any other interesting um, climate activists that maybe aren't in the um, limelight in the West. So what can you do? Um, first thing is listen and share stories of people of colour in the climate change narratives. So that can, um, that's dependent, that's not dependent on any um, of your race or anything. But yeah, just sharing sort of stories from marginalised people or people whose um, voices isn't allowed, um, heard as loud as others um, is always in a good place to start. Um, follow climate stories from across the world. So maybe um, assess where you're getting your news from. Is that could you sort of diversify and hear um, climate news from around the world? Do further research. So yeah, that's always, it's kind of, 
down to the individual to sort of um, educate themselves on these issues. Um, yeah, use some of the topics. Uh, I would say this, but use some of the topics that were discussed in this webinar to um, put yourself down a rabbit hole of some of the other issues or um, interesting areas that you find um, within climate and race. And yeah, please let us know if anything comes up that's interesting. Yeah, be great to learn more. Um, and yeah, and talk about these topics with friends and family in appropriate and perhaps inappropriate situations. Um, yeah, talk about sort of how climate and race interacts. I know when I brought this up that I was doing this webinar in front of my friends, they sort of were like, oh, how does it um, interact? So yeah, sort of interesting. Don't assume everyone has the same level of knowledge as yourself. And what can you do to enact change? So call out climate exclusion where possible. If you're um, wherever it call it out, um, sort of I've shared examples of climate exclusion in the webinar and hopefully you'll be able to um, see examples. Hopefully there aren't too many, but yeah. Um, contact your local representative about environmental racism where possible. So where appropriate, um, contact your local representative if you're um, doing a bit of research and you found out about some environmental racism uh, in an area near you or in your country. Um, and contact climate change organisations and sustainability companies about diversity in their organisation. So um, often they will have like a diversity and inclusion, but maybe um, dig a bit deeper and think what are they actually doing to um, address the fact that um, ethnic minorities make up such a small proportion of the environmental sector. <laughs> so yeah, now on to the challenge. Um, send us your jar for a template email social media post or letter that could be used um, or sent to an environmental organization company or person asking them how they're dealing with the issue of lack of diversity in the sustain environmental sustainability field so as always we kind of use uh, a one page maximum uh, as a template for yeah these kind of posts so keep it to down to a page um over fine but yeah just as a guideline um, and email your response to sustainability at london.ac.uk and the deadline um, as is usual is the 14th of March. I will note for the last webinar that we did on um, greenwashing we extended the deadline to the 25th of February so if you haven't done that challenge yet um, yeah you've still got time on that because these are so close together but yeah. Um, along with in addition to the sustainability advocate award um, the prize for this will be a book bundle on climate change and racial books um, worth a hundred pounds. So lots of books we can get in there. Um, and yeah, lots of interesting authors on this topic. Um, yeah, hopefully you can win. And yeah, again, the winner will be invited to take part in an interview um, and sort of share that your thoughts on this um, topic. But yeah. Uh, the next webinar we've got is on COP26 uh, kind of debrief. So um, ahead of this webinar, if you don't know anything about COP, COP we did a um, sort of overview of COP last year. So on this webinar will be taking place on March 15th, um, again with an earlier and a later time. So I hope to see some of you guys there and yeah, contributing. Um, I think Matt's just putting in some of the links to the webinar so you can sign up now. Uh, yeah, so um, the discussion point and Q&A. So yeah, on to the bit about how do you think that um, the environment and race interact in your country? So we've kind of discussed different ways climate and race can inter interact. Um, yeah, I hope I've yeah, sort of shed some light on some of the ways, but yeah, it would be interesting to hear um, you guys. Um, also, Matt, if possible, we have um, we started to take feedback from each webinar at the end of each webinar. So Matt's going to put in a short feedback form that would be really helpful if you guys could fill out just for um, helping make us better in the future. But yeah, I'll stop talking for a second and hand over to Matt so we can revisit this. Brilliant. Yeah, thank you very much, Ryan. Um, and yeah, thank you very much, everyone. It's been <clears throat> great to have so much uh, activity going on in the chat and so many of you engaging. So yeah, thank you very much. Um, well, yeah, we really appreciate you getting so involved. Um, there have been a few other people who um, I think it seems the time lag seems to be different depending on where people are around the globe as well. So um, a few people had uh, slightly later comments um, in terms of uh, that the, the question Ryan posed around a kind of all white male board. Um, 
one person said that kind of the problem with any all boys club is groupthink and a homogenous um, philosophy, which I think is yeah, a really nice succinct way of kind of summarizing a lot of what of us, a lot, a lot of what many of us were saying previously. Um, I think someone else raises another really interesting point, which yeah, really grateful to you for bringing up, um, is that they say that, yeah, um, I think if a board is made up of all the same people, whatever gender or race they are, um, they are limited in their views and lived experiences and ideas. Diversity is always better. And I think, yeah, you make a really good point. I think it's kind of having that breadth of engagement kind of across um, any group we have will always make it stronger. Kind of every, every different person brings different things to um, a discussion, brings different lived experiences as you touch on and the kind of broader range of people you can have bringing that in, the broader, um, the kind of the better representation you have and probably the more effective you will be in whatever you're looking to do. So um, yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. I think that's a really important point. And then um, some more good news. Um, someone shared that um, Apple's Vice President of Sustainability is um, uh, Lisa Jackson. Um, so female and was previously the head of, um, I imagine, America's EPA Environmental Protection Agency. So um, yeah, no, nice to see that there is um, representation, um, kind of certainly female representation, um, and kind of, yeah, someone with a clearly real experience in it. Um, so yeah, thank you very much um, for posting those. As I said, we ha have accrued a couple of questions that are going along. If anyone else has any further, please um, yeah, share them in the chat. Um, so yeah, first question I'll pose to you, Ryan, um, came in from kind of someone joining anonymously, um, who said, as countries in the global south continue to develop, they will contribute more to climate change. Whilst we desperately need to do more in the UK and other more developed countries, what in your opinion, uh, what is your opinion on what other countries should, on what, other, on what developing countries should be doing? So kind of, yeah, obviously we're doing a lot in developed countries, but how, what do you think developing countries should be doing with an awareness that um, I suppose in the future as they develop there is likely that their um, emissions will increase too. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, that's a really, um, yeah, it's a really good question and uh, yeah, quite a difficult question to um, yeah make an answer to succinct. But um, I think in terms of infrastructure and sort of looking at um, all the different ways that um, climate change interacts and we've kind of got a bit of a lessons learned um, in more again developed countries that um, we can apply to sort of developing countries so getting infrastructure in terms of renewable energy sources also I think um, changing of I know in some developing countries their sort of methods of cooking um, can yeah put out quite a lot of um, carbon emissions so sort of continual education not in terms of sort of a preachy way but in terms of um, embedding it in younger generations especially countries as such like some countries have such like young populations it's really um, yeah an exciting way to get sort of climate um, climate discussions in early so when those people are sort of in positions of power in the future climate will be embedded into their way of thinking and um, yeah going forward I'm not I'm not sure what I fully yeah think on the fact that sort of as a country becomes more developed it has to it has to create um sort of a negative impact on the environment I think that's sort of what history has shown but I um, I'm optimistic that going forward maybe that isn't the framework that has to exist yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, I like that idea of kind of spinning the narrative on its head, really. If, yeah, kind of, I suppose it, there's there's so many questions in there. It's a really interesting question. I suppose what you're touching on then is that kind of final question of what is development, I suppose, because I suppose that many of us see that, yeah, that there is an understandable desire to kind of, I suppose, replicate what developed nations have done, which is to kind of, as we develop, have uh, greater um, uh, kind of owned wealth, kind of have more things, have kind of bigger houses, eat more food, um, and I th there are many of those which think kind of that, that food element, I suppose, is yeah something we'd hope for everyone across the globe, but perhaps kind of our views on wealth could potentially change. So kind of instead of looking to GDP for um, kind of seeing kind of the wealth of a country, maybe um, kind of look more broadly than that. I know um, there are people who kind of like look at gross, nas growth nas gross national happiness um, and other certain um, indicators. So perhaps kind of an idea along those lines would be interesting. I think to kind of answer your question more kind of in the lines that I think it was posed, I suppose um, this to a degree is where climate finance, which is discussed heavily at COP and was kind of a big, it remains a big bone of contention, really could play a part. 
to ensure yeah that as kind of developing countries develop they do so kind of in a cleaner greener approach so kind of instead of moving on to kind of going through kind of coal and those sorts of things which absolutely the developed countries did and I absolutely agree that every country has the right to develop but if that route to development could be looking at kind of green technologies as opposed to um, kind of carbon producing technologies that that could be one way of one way of really helping um, and also I think it's quite interesting not always but I think a lot of kind of many kind of developed countries are kind of within that kind of equatorial region um, where perhaps uh, kind of renewable energy renewable resources that are, are more abundant and therefore kind of can link up quite nicely um, to kind of have that provision um, but equally I think it is a difficult piece um, because obviously developed countries have had that history of developing in an unclean way um, so yeah I think it, it is a difficult question um, but I think we can there are certainly kind of different ways it can be approached hopefully um, kind of tackle tackle that and take us all kind of get us all to that level of um, social development but without kind of huge um, degradation uh, of the environment so yeah, no, thank you very much for posing that question. Um, another question that came in as we were going along, Ryan, um, was, yeah, so they did note that you might touch on it later, which you did, but um, yeah, they wanted to know um, what can we do um, to kind of uh, have an impact on this area and kind of, I suppose, reduce uh, environmental racism? Um, uh, and um, is there anything um, that we're doing personally um, that we can suggest as well. So yeah, any thoughts and advice you've got would be brilliant. Uh, yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, if you could go to the last slide as well on the uh, sort of our socials and stuff, that it'd be great to share some of these um, comments on our um, yeah reduce reduce connect forum. So some of the more open questions. Um, unless you guys uh, yeah object, I'll be sharing on the yeah reduce reduce connect forum as well. So hopefully we can get. Um, wider range you don't just need to listen to me but um in terms of what i can do what you can i do personally and what can you do personally um i think i think kind of researching um specifics of how climate and race interacts even locally in your area locally in your city um i think can give you a great springboard in terms of picking a um more single issue i know across the world it can feel um it can feel like such a large problem with so many different factors. I know when I was researching this, I didn't want to make it just about um, sort of like ethnic minorities within Western countries. And then that kind of brings in the whole discussion of like a black person in um, Nigeria isn't an ethnic minority. So how does it um, interact within that? So sort of getting your head around um, how you frame it uh, is really important. And then I would also say, um, in the UK, there's the Black Environmental Network, which I offered to like do some volunteering for. So maybe um, applying your skills, and I think this applies to a lot around sort of um, climate change topics, is applying the skills that you already have to organisations that you think um, are deserving of your volunteering time or even maybe your professional time. So yeah, finding organisations such as the Black Environmental Network in the UK where you can um, help them out in terms of sort of maybe admin tasks or whatever other skills you have design or anything uh yeah matt yeah brilliant no thank you very much Ryan. i think yeah it's really helpful to kind of get those views and yeah i know we've spoken in the past um about yeah what you your kind of experience with the black environment network so um yeah thank you for sharing that and yeah i think i think uh, i can go back to the slide actually i think yeah those suggestions you had of kind of what what people can do as individuals um to kind of create that individual change um, yeah, you said, yeah, create that individual change. Um, yeah, I think one piece is having kind of those difficult conversations with family and friends, which I think you touched on nicely of kind of, yeah, where appropriate and also where not appropriate. Um, I suppose perhaps some of those conversations have, well, actually, I don't think I've had any necessarily to do with climate and race, but certainly had over the last, I suppose, kind of year and a half, two years, I had a number of um, conversations with family members that were perhaps well, were in fact really quite uncomfortable for me and for them but I think really important to be had and I think it's only through doing that that everyone learns and I think for me kind of being consist trying to constantly be a better ally um, I think there's a lot of it is that is kind of even if you feel awkward about something it's still confronting it um, and also kind of being willing to learn though being willing and open to learn and to kind of be wrong and where you are wrong recognize that and kind of continue to educate yourself and do better um, it's kind of yeah 
my view on kind of how to be a better ally around these sorts of issues. Um, I think that's what it is, the, the better allies that we can all be, um, speaking speaking as a white male, um, the better ally that we can be kind of, yeah, is, is better supporting those groups. And then I suppose also speaking as a gay white male, it's also kind of the, the, the respect I have for allies in the LGBT community. So I think it's kind of seeing the power that brings to me as a minority in one sense, and then wanting that to carry kind of that across, and I suppose almost pay it forward to a degree um, to kind of, yeah, support other people. So um, yeah, I think kind of taking one's allyship seriously um, is probably what I would say in kind of what I'd like to think I do, um, what we can all do as well. Um, so yeah, no, thank you very much everyone for your questions. It's been, yeah, great. We've had really good interaction for everyone today. So thank you ever so much for that. Um, it's been great to have you all with us. I will bounce forward on to our socials again in case anybody missed those. So yeah, um, a few people have said that they'll follow up on YouTube. Um, a number of people have asked for the slides as well. If you do want copies of the slides, we're always happy to share them. Just email us at sustainability at london.ac.uk and Ryan will be very happy to um, yeah, send across the full set of slides. And he's also got kind of some notes with some references for some of the research that he's done as well. So I can share that if that's of any use. Um, yeah, get involved on Instagram. As Ryan said, we've got our members forum on um, Facebook. So yeah, we'll post some, Ryan will be posting some questions on there. So yeah, get involved in that. And yeah, feel free to post your own questions. We really want that to be a space for Reduce the Juice Connect members for you to be able to kind of interact more directly. Um, we're aware that unfortunately Teams doesn't give you guys the opportunity to speak directly. It's kind of uh, you posting your questions and then us kind of sharing them between ourselves, which is always a bit of a shame. So yeah, we really hope that you guys will be able to get involved through there um, and kind of yeah continue the conversation online. So um, yeah, well, thank you very much everyone for getting involved. Thank you, Ryan, for um, the presentation. Um, and yeah, look forward to seeing you all at the next webinar. I'll hand over to you, Ryan, for the final piece. Yeah, just the last... Um yeah, the last you hear from me is uh, thank you, and yeah, thank you so much for sharing your opinions, sharing your ideas, um, questions, everything. Is I, I really enjoyed this topic, um, and think it's really important. So thank you very much for um, contributing. But yeah, hopefully see you guys at the next webinar on March fifteenth.